have um, 20 odd people. So I think we're going to have to be really strict about introducing ourselves in 20 seconds each. And even yeah. that, um, was for a maximum of 20 seconds. So, um, what's the best way of doing this? Hang on. Okay, so I'm going to do, I'm going to do me first and I'm going to go down the list of uh, people that I've got in front of me. So my name's Mark Johnson. Um, I'm, I've been involved in AMPA not very long really, about three years, certainly uh, nowhere near as long as many of you. And um, I'm a musician originally. I then uh, have studied cybernetics and um, become interested in physics. So that's why I'm here. Right, Andrew. Well, I'm Andrew Crompton. I'm from Liverpool University. I'm an architect. I'm interested in G. Spencer Brown, cybernetics and physics. And on we go. Who's next? On we go. Um, Mike Horner. I'm going to introduce myself in the anniversary talk in a few minutes. Great. Okay. Now then I've got a mic, a guest in brackets. I don't know who that is, but if you know you are Mike with guest in brackets, please speak now. Well, I, I don't know. I don't have any brackets, but I have Mike with no picture. It's you. I can see it's you. I'm it's fine. Can you see me? Yeah, uh, we can't. We can just see Mike yes, on the screen. Me. Yes, yes, me too. I, I'm not able to turn my... I can't turn on my video for some reason. All right. Don't worry about it. Just give oh, us some words. words. Give us some words. Who are you? Okay. Uh, I'm Mike Mampy, and uh, I've been, uh, I'm the second oldest AMPA member. Wow. I'm saying the oldest AMPA member. Uh, they only gave him a governor and he's got a year on me. So my first AMPA meeting was in 1981. And I'm just studying costs and awareness and computer systems. Great. Good, good to see you. Okay, thank you. So the next person on my list is Roger. Hi, I'm Roger Anderton. I'm from Southampton and I'm retired at the moment. Cheers. Okay, um, the next person is Doug Matsky. Hey, can you all hear me? Yep. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm, I've been working with Mike Banthe since oh, hey, yeah. 1994. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You're a bit quiet. Turn yeah. your volume and, up, Doug. Okay. Okay. Bye. And uh, I don't know. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. There you go. Just and uh, I've been working on ge geometric okay, algebra. Okay. Fine. And some other people no. should probably mute themselves if they're not talking. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and I've been working on geometric algebra, and I'll be giving a talk in two weeks about geometric algebra, what I've been doing, and we're working with Mike Manthe. I was a FISCOM chairman of FISCOM 92 and FISCOM 94, and AMP, I had a session in 94 on, on all of their stuff. So. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, the next person is John Torday. Hi, I'm calling from jolly old Philadelphia in the U.S. Uh, I'm an evolutionary biologist, and I've tried to marry my evolutionary theory of cell biology to Peter Rowland's rewrite system and um, a paper under review marrying it to quantum mechanics and I'm speaking next week. Great. Okay, thank you, uh, John. So, uh, David McGovern. Hi, uh, let's see, as Mike Manthe mentioned, uh, probably the oldest uh, member except for John Hampson. Um, and, uh, hmm. My specialty is uh, physics and mathematics, and then uh, moved into science, and have been uh, trying to learn other things as life moves on. Great, thank you. Okay, Granville Kroll. Hi, I'm Granville Kroll, been involved with AMPA for uh, about 15 years. Um, from a, uh, a few different uh, threads to my contribution, but most recently um, looking at number theory and uh, the uh, prime numbers. Fantastic. Okay, and you're talking next week. Uh, John Hyatt. Hi, I'm John. Um, I'm at LJMU. I'm the director of the Institute of Art and Technology. I spoke last year and I'm speaking this year on the 1st of September. I'm an artist, a musician and somebody who's genuinely curious about 
Okay, and um, Nicola. Oh, hi. Oh, hello, everybody. This is so nice to see you on mic. It's so lovely that you're here. Uh, anyway, and uh, yeah, and you people I've never seen, like David McGovern, you know, because we've communicated. Anyway, I'm a Pythagorean mathematician and I'm an inclusion evangelist because my middle child has Down syndrome. That's about it. That'll do. <laughs> and I'm speaking next to you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, Anton. Anton? You're muted, you need to Anton. unmute. Uh, okay, here. Yeah. Okay, here. Yeah. And hi. Hi, everyone. I have uh, how many years now? Four or five? I sort of delve in alternative physics. Um, let's see how we're in Texas. Anyway, nice seeing you all. And yeah. Uh, let's see what comes out this year. Okay. Oh, by the way, I'm treasurer as well of the organization. And somebody else must help me with it. <laughs> okay. Um, Pat Toms. Hello. I'm in Glasgow in Scotland. Last year I went to Pampa. Ah. To Nicola in Fife. So I'm interested in form and field of form. That is what you actually experience. The shape of things. Okay. Um, Lou. Lou. Sure, you get the unmuted there. Hi, I'm Lou Kaufman. I'm a mathematician. I work on uh, topology and things related to physics, not theory and physics, and uh, I'll be talking soon. Okay. Uh, Peter Rowlands. We've got two Peters here, which is also going to get confusing. Peter Rowlands. Mute. Sorry. Um, yeah, I'm a physicist from Liverpool University. I'm a long-term member of AMPA more than 20 years, and I'm talking tomorrow. Great. Um, we've got another Peter who isn't Peter Rowlands. Yes, that's me. This is Peter Master. Uh, I was at the first meeting, uh, the first official meeting of AMPA in 1980 with uh, one or two of the other uh, People from the, the other side of the Atlantic, and my uh, my in, my main interest in all this has always been to work out how the human brain works. Ah, yeah. Okay, so uh, Tom Hyatt. Hello, um, I'm John Son. Uh, here as his guest, but he's always spoken quite highly at these conferences. So I thought I would sit in and see what's what. I, my background's uh, physics and philosophy masters, and then I've been a musician for a while, as you can see. And then um, I'm now doing a PhD uh, at, in Liverpool at LJMU about electromagnetic artworks. So if any of you know any, then send them my way. But uh, yeah, look forward to hearing what's going on. Great. Thank you. Okay, uh, Vanessa. Unmute yourself, Vanessa. Vanessa. Nearly there. there Hi, we are. sorry. Sorry. All right. <laughs> Hi, Vanessa Hill. Um, I'm a molecular biologist. Um, been a member of AMPA for a while, on and off. And I work with Peter on some of the geometric um, aspects of the rewrite system uh, related to physics and biology. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, Astrid? Hi, I'm Astrid. Uh, in my day job, I'm uh, a graphic designer, a political activist. I work for the Green Party in England and Wales. I'm the wife of Mark, and I thought I spent this summer a bit of joining some thinking. One comment, very few women on this. Ooh. <laughs> it's, it's a problem. I like your paintings. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Richard. Hi, I'm Rich Haberger from Philadelphia. Um, I like that phrasing. My day job is a retired professor of statistics. Um, my 
primary interest is statistical computing and design of statistical software. Great. Okay. Rachel. Hi. Um, I crashed the last AMPA last year after the Laws of Form conference. So just wanted to check it out again <laughs> this year since it's online. Um, I am a software engineer and then I studied philosophy in school. That's great. That's really good. Okay, so uh, I, I, um, there's a name M. Uh, Derg. I can see. I don't know who. Uh, can you can you introduce yourself? Does that make any sense? <laughs> I just see M. Erk Derg guest. All right. Well. Is it Erk Derg? Oh yeah, could be. Is Erk Dergen there? That would be lovely. Are you there, Erk Derg? <laughs> It's a little bit like a seance, isn't it? Um, <laughs> we used to unmute. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> good. Can you say something? Are you muted, Ed? Can you unmute? No. Try and get him on later. All right, we'll do it later. Um, yeah. Who haven't I done? Have we, have we, have we been around? Uh, Colin, Colin's just come in actually. Colin, do you want to say something about yourself? Uh, yes, I'm retired from Warwick University, maths professor, uh, specializing in cosmology at the moment. Okay. Um, I'm just, I'm looking down this list, which keeps moving around in front of me to see if I've actually forgotten anybody. Um, Mike Heather and Ian, you've forgotten. Uh, Mike Heather, yes, go on. And Ossetan. Yes, I'm Michael Heather. <laughs> uh, I've, uh, I worked in, uh, hello, I worked in uh, experimental geophysics, ge geophysical fluid dynamics, about 50 years ago. And uh, I've been coming to AMPA uh, since the early 80s, off and on, with Nick Rossiter. So we, we took it in turns to do, we did joint papers, but only one of us turned up to give it. I'm now retired, uh, living in Devon. I died and went to Devon. And uh, that's it. Okay, all right. I think I've done everybody. If I haven't, then um, you can so be you the first. Nick, Nick Rossiter and EM. Nick Rossiter. Nick, oh, sorry. Yes, Nick. I thought I'd done Nick. But anyway, I, maybe I spoke to Nick before we introduced everybody. Nick. Yes. Um, how do I get myself onto the screen? Just yeah, you're, you're on the screen now. You're live. On the screen. That's Don't great. swear. I, I was a computing scientist for many years and databases was my subject, which I taught endless undergraduates and graduates. I'm very interested in category theory, and we use that for the applications and things like information systems. Recently become interested in music, and uh, that, is, that might be the talk that we decided to give in early September. I'm keen on moving category theory into real numbers, as well, right. away from discreteness. Okay, and yes, Ian, um, uh, yeah. you, you, okay, you introduce so. yourself. <laughs> I, I thought I spoke about, uh, a lot uh, before, so yeah. <laughs> anyway, my name is Enrico, I live in Italy, um, I'm a graphic designer and uh, I'm still in uh, Laws of Form and drawing in general, I don't know, I just received this nice board <laughs> on which I'm drawing and uh, I I hope to listen to what you are going to say. Okay. Well, it's it's really great um, to to see so many people here. Twenty six people. That's um, that's more than we usually get in Amper. Um, <laughs> and um, this is this is this is going to this the this whole period now. The, these next few weeks are, are really a big experiment. We began this. Um, with a discussion about whether we could run some sort of conference online 
and we had some discussion about the best way of doing it. Do we want to spend a whole day staring at Zoom talking to each other? Do we want to split it up into lots of presentations and so on? I think one of the things that I'm most enthusiastic about in doing it online and with Zoom is the fact that we get a whole load of recordings of talks which we will put onto Amper's YouTube channel which I think is, has got about three or four recordings at the moment. Um, Anton, is that right? Okay. So um, for the delay, I just needed to unmute myself first. Um, yes, there are basically the four recordings that uh, we received two or three years ago from Mike Horner of Amper in Conversation, uh, which are on there. And otherwise, you know, hopefully we'll now get some more on there. And as yeah. soon as I come on, I will make them available on the website. Yeah. So there, there is something very exciting happening with um, so many academics being forced to work online. And as a result, we're amassing huge amounts of um, video material, which is going to be available for, forever now. People will be able to watch these talks, um, you know, long, long after we're not here which I think is, is an important thing. Um, we, there is some uncertainty uh, for us as we were planning the program as to whether the format of one presentation per day at five o'clock UK time every day, whether that's actually convenient for people, particularly people in the States. I, I think we, it would be good to have a discussion maybe in the chat uh, forum as to whether that is the format that we go ahead with beyond this week. I suggest that we stick to it this week, but um, I'm, I'm certainly, I think, I think we're all quite flexible as to um, making it as convenient as possible for, for everyone who wants to participate, uh, because it's important. In the end, it's important that we create something that uh, we all feel comfortable engaging with and fits around the, the busy lives that we're all we're all sort of in, engaged with. Um, I don't know uh, if uh, one of my co-hosts want to say something briefly just before uh, I let um, Mike kick off with his his historical talk. Um, Andrew. Onward, onward. Is that all you want to say? <laughs> okay. Okay, Peter. Yeah, can, uh, I'm just got a practical point. Can people, when the speaker starts or just before, mute their microphones yes. and knock their cameras off for two reasons, for, to get good sound recording quality and also to get uh, good bandwidth? Yeah, yeah that's, 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 I was about to say that. Yeah. So, um, uh, if, so, um, uh, if... Not here. So if people on the space bar, they can temporarily talk. That way, they don't have to keep muting and unmuting manually. They can press the space bar. Oh, I didn't know that. That's very useful. Okay. You have to hold it down while you want to talk, and then yeah. Really okay. Excellent. Okay, so we can all mute ourselves, and if we want to say something, we can just hold down the space bar. <laughs> So what, what I'm now going to do is I'm, I'm going to mute everybody. Somebody has dreadful feedback. Okay, can you still hear me? I muted myself. Yes. Yeah. You can still hear me. Okay, so I've, I've muted everybody now. Um, so Yes, if, if anybody wants to talk, you can just press space and talk, and I think I think that will work. So, does someone want to just try that? Andrew, can you just try that? Hello? Yeah, yeah brilliant. That works. That's fine. Okay. So, um, well, I think without uh, uh, any more delay, I should hand over to Mike and to introduce his presentation on the history of Amper. So, um, so Mike, you can unmute yourself. I will mute myself. And, can I interrupt um, at this point? Yes. Um, 
can this uh, recording be stopped and a new recording started for uh, just or can we edit this later we can edit this one okay mike You're muted, Mike. Unmute yourself, Mike. Okay. Is that right now? That's fine. Good. You can hear me now, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I did not introduce myself before because my first few thoughts are to do with how I came to be selected to uh, give this anniversary talk, as it's sometimes called. Uh, I foolishly admitted that I'd been recently running a uh, Zoom conference and that I had been in ANPA since AD 1988, and so I was selected. But there may be, uh, shall we say, other reasons. I was in the computer industry and after my first midlife crisis, I decided I didn't want to be a manager and I was moved to be a manager of systems research, which had exactly seven people and I had some individual responsibilities. One responsibility was to manage a group at CERN. I'm going to assume everybody knows what CERN is. Peter, Rowlands and I have made several visits together there, but on the occasion of having a meeting to a little engineering group which I was managing, I was told by the IT manager that I was asking questions which he'd never ever heard before except from a man called Peter Massa. And so he gave me Peter Massa's phone number and his address. I went to see Peter and he invited me to Anpa. That was AD 1988, and with the exception of a year when I managed to damage myself and have a new hip as a result, I've been going every year. Now, at the time, if you became an AMPA member, believe it or not, there was an interview, and Pierre Noyes was the person who gave the interview. And I found that he wanted to talk about management not about any technical content, which was very disappointing. But he said that he had done some work which was taking and put as a loosely coupled group of nutcases, I think I'm quoting accurately here, uh, and putting it into what an American would call a management well-organized thing. It had a statement of purpose, and there were things called executive councils, advisory boards, and so on. And to show you how politics even entered into Anpa at the beginning, he wanted me to have a permanent slot, which would be non-voting, and that would mean that I would not have to be elected every year, which the president was and the coordinator was, and so on. And so I took notes, and I have in all of the backups of my computers notes from 1988 up to about 2012. You can see here the primary purpose. I'm not going to read it out. I'm sure you read it by now. Now, if you have purchased an excellent piece of literature, this is the cover of a book which was done in the honor of Pierre Noyes on the and 90th birthday was published in about 2013. And in there, page 126, is a management section, which I was bludgeoned into producing. So what I'm producing, what I'm talking about, is actually extract from the a formal history put together by um, John Anson, Lou Kaufman, and a lot of people, which was put together for that occasion. 
So I didn't even have to do a lot of homework, but what I'm gonna do is take several views. This first view I call the formal view. Here's a, uh, shall we say, a constraint. When people say ANPA, the majority of the people in the room or in the room, in, in the, on the screen, they mean ANPA, full stop, ANPA East. However, with respect to Mike Manthe and David McGovern and a few others, there was a very successful entity called ANPA West, which I am not qualified to talk about. But I have suggested to David McGovern that he takes up the baton and does some work to correct this dreadful mistake. I also restrain myself to speaking about ANPA up to about 2012, which was up to the period when it left Cambridge and went to Rowlands Castle. And I must admit that at the time, I thought this was a move by Peter Rowlands, but I was corrected. It's the name of a place and he doesn't live in the castle. And that afterwards, as you probably know, the meetings then moved to Liverpool. Now in this, effort to put together all of the brief history of ANPA, I use the proceedings. Most of you have seen proceedings. If I hold one up to the camera, can you see that, anybody? Not that it's important, but there are proceedings which were diligently produced year in and year out for many, many years. So that was my database. And here we go on some actual content. The, shall we say, formation of ANPA comes in various views. And I'm going to take the easy view, which was expressed by Pierre Noyes. He got together with other people, four, four of them in number, plus himself, and he put together, in that sense, a formal thing. The proceedings were not immediately produced, but they came out in seven and nine, and they were edited by Pierre Noyes. We call these meetings and for seven and nine. And they had a very distinct style. And in this first formative years period, up to about 2000, well, up to Amper nine, at the end, Pierre Noyes said, we have achieved a discrete reconciliation of quantum mechanics and relativity by going beyond the conceptual framework of Bohr and Einstein. A pretty heavy claim way back when. In the next section, I called it the growth years from AMPA 10 to AMPA 18. And there you see in yellow an example of the proceedings which had grown to be A4. And there were nine meetings. As promised in the uh, early purpose statement, the combinatorial hierarchy was examined. And from the point of view of some people at the meetings, re-examined. Discrete topic, discrete physics was a common topic. And I counted the people, I kept records of the people who were there and the membership was judged by attendance in a meeting. And there were more and more, meeting, more and more people and the quality of the papers seemed to have got better and better. And towards the end of this period, the uh, range of the topics was changed, but the foundational ideas were a little bit wider, were seriously examined, but denominated. Now, some people who've come across AMPA have got some worries that we are dealing with spiritual matters. And this arises from some situations in this period, which I call the philosophical years, between AMPA 19 and AMPA 24. Now, as a member of the Executive Council, I was introduced to some of the grimy things to do with money. And the reason that we, meaning ANFA, joined up with some people called the Epiphany Philosophers is that they were able to supply money, which we were able to use to run ANFA. There were two major expenses 
The meeting itself, which only just broke even, the president and the coordinator to do all the organizing. So as a gesture, we had two lots of um, proceedings in those years. And so in that period, although there were only six years, there were 11 proceedings. The meetings in themselves had now become organized in a different way. This was a very, very welcome situation because prior to that, we would turn up as a member, we would have meetings, uh, excuse me, presentations back to back, and then finally, we would not really met the other people. So we had a really good session in the Executive Council a few months before this, and we decided that there would be a lot of time for people to talk to each other, much as I'm hoping we'll be able to do using Zoom. There was another responsibility, which was where an individual, not the president or the coordinator, was given responsibility for the day. And I can give you just a tiny story on this when I was responsible for the day. One of our most beloved people was Ted Bastin. And as person for the day, I had to make sure that he could deal with the technology and we were using overhead slides, we were using PowerPoint, and Ted wanted to use a blackboard and easel. So I had to rustle around, find a blackboard and easel, and get a rubber and so on. And he put the blackboard up on the easel and he turned it over because the side that he had didn't rub out very well. And on the back was his speech for the previous year. So he rubbed out of the title, changed it, and then continued. I hope you find this amusing. <laughs> okay, next. The mature years were between AMPA 25 and AMPA 32, and lots of things were improved. However, it became clear that the things had to be, money ideas had to be addressed. But the content of the meetings evolved Younger people were beginning to be respected and having a lot more to say in the content and in the discussions which we held between, as it were, the formal talks. The philosophical proceedings were dropped. And overall, I think for me, this was a very, very interesting period. However, it could not last. So when we moved from that, there was, from my point of view, a different version of ANPA. So that's the end of my view, as it were, from the peer noise point of view, which is the formal one. These were the meetings, this is what happened. Now, here's another view. Imagine you're a member, and I know there are people who have, in this 26, uh, who will disagree with what I'm highlighting, I think a simplistic view of ANPA at that time was the focus was an annual meeting. You went to Cambridge, there were a week of lectures and there were discussions. There was a formal dinner. There were the proceedings from last year, which you had to pay for sometimes. There was a guest speaker and there were what I call unusual events. And these things had evolved over the years. I have here a notebook. I use the notebook every year. And this is the notebook which I used in the year 2004. People arrived on the Friday or the Saturday. The Executive Council met to get their act together. On the Sunday, there was a dinner. On Monday, there was a special evening talk by a woman called Lynn Claire Dennis, or Lynn Dennis Claire, I don't remember exactly. And there was a session where somebody who was interested in things which they managed to earn for a living, but had no scientific explanation. And such as that's why I said a dowser. And there were also some interesting people who came along who were healers. And these people 
provided a service because some people like the president and myself to some extent used to get wound up so we had a healing session okay now this is my favorite view and as a social system i would claim that the amazing founders which are named john amson frederick parker rhodes ted bastin clive kilminster and pierre Noyes performed a very magical act now as somebody who was brought up in england educated in the british system i have a huge respect for Oxford and Cambridge, with Cambridge getting the slightly larger share. And there are some words, which I'm going to use later, which came directly from John Anson, which says that in a way, what Amper benefited from was a very, very interesting situation in Cambridge. Here's a picture that Peter Master has already referred to. He's in the picture there. This is 1980, and it's called Amper One. And here's John Amson. Now, John Amson, the man who organizes PANPA and is the current president, is the only living member of the five official founders. But he has told me some stories which indicate, in fact, that there may be one or two other people who could potentially be regarded as part of the the founding, as it were, social system. So here I'm reading out John Amson in 1964 and 1966. Call this the pre amper phase. I, John Amson, met Ted Bastin in 1959 when he was living as part of the extended eccentric household maintained by Richard Braithwaite and Margaret Mesterman. Margaret, the founder of the Cambridge Language Research Unit, was instrumental in collecting together and inspiring one of the most eccentric fringe groups of intellects in a university town where such groupings have always been historically necessary. Ted one day suggested that I might be interested in devoting some hours a week to thinking about a piece of mathematics that was preoccupying him. He said the idea had come from an Eddingtonian model of a universe that he'd been working on earlier. To help explain the project, he invited me to think about it, and Ted introduced me then to Frederick Parker Rhodes, sometimes known as AFPR. The combinatorial hierarchy was really the joint offspring of Ted and Fred and a man called Gordon Pask. Ted and Gordon had been studying real-time analog linear transformations using electrical hardware built from wartime surface equipment. Now here I have a very faint link to myself. I was involved with the computer industry prior to 1963 when I fooled around with my first digital computer and I was manager of a group which produced analog computers and one of the clients was Gordon Pask. Clive Kilminster then joined in. Clive is one of the main founders and he and Ted were great buddies. I one time asked Clive why he worked with Ted and he pondered and then he said to me, Ted knows things he shouldn't really know. Ted was an old Eddingtonian collaborator he had a first PhD in physics and a second in mathematics. Clive was a clear mathematical thinker in Eddingtonian terms, and he became intrigued in the combinatorial hierarchy, which as a Swiss person, I abbreviate as the CH. Fred and I worked closely together, said John Anson, <laughs> in 1965, on what he began, we began to call essential finite, finiteness of this hierarchical construction. This was the discovery that unnerved Fred, that his hierarchy growth could not continue forever. Fred's important stopping rule could probably be replaced now 
by another one since the sizes of the first four levels are prime numbers, double mercy in primes. I think that is enough of that. Okay, so this was a, an abbreviated version or I just read out and here we go a little bit more about Arthur Frederick Parker Rhodes. I didn't know Frederick but for a while I lived in North London and I used to walk dogs for a person who was unable to do that and I met Adam Frederick Parker Rhodes and his daughter i.e child and grandchild of Frederick and they talked a lot about him. Frederick was clearly a very very unusual person and we will hear more about his achievements in the area of, of semantics from Dino in the near future. But the one thing that struck me really, really strangely about Frederick was that he claimed, or people claimed on his behalf, is that he could speak or understand 23 languages. And if he needed to understand the meaning of a word, he didn't look in the dictionary, he sort of went inside himself and somehow the universe, maybe the Akashic records, were given the result. Now, Pierre Noyes, as I say, the formal founder of the formal way of thinking about Amper, a very special man, he wrote this book, the bit on bit string physics, which is very, very interesting and very complete. And here's Dr. Dr. Ted Bastin. It's not a misprint. He did have two doctors. That's one maths and one physics. And he with Ted, excuse me, he with Clive produced this book called Combinatorial Physics. Anybody who wants to understand AMPA and to some extent combinatorial physics, I fully recommend this book. It's a great read, particularly the first few pages. Now here, I believe this is Clive with John Amundsen, and the reason I've chosen this particular book is that Clive met Ted when he went to the library to get out an Eddington book and found out that this person, Bastin, was already in possession of it. And they used to josh about this forever afterwards. So these people were the amazing founders. And I claim <coughs> that social systems die when the founder's vision is lost. But I'm claiming on your behalf, <coughs> from my own observation, that AMPA is not dead. And there are a couple of amazing people you're going to hear later on who definitely are carrying on. Peter Rowland's work is spectacular. Lou's work is here demonstrating his skill with the cat's cradle and therefore to, uh, leads us on to topology, is also a very special person. I'm sorry they have to restrict themselves to 20 seconds. They've got so many talents and so many interests. So to conclude, here are answers to the question. If somebody says to you, what is ANPA? I would say, the first line, the Alternative Natural Philosophy Association, you usually have to spell that out, is an unusual international association with British and American roots. When David McGovern talks about the AMPA West, you will understand that my constraint of only knowing about AMPA East is quite severe. Another view of AMPA is that it's a safety valve where academics can present and discuss alternative views which would normally dis be disallowed and would risk getting their tenure taken away. A second view, or a third view perhaps, is that science has been promising a paradigm shift ever since Kuhn made the term part of common speech, and Anpa has made this shift. If we have, and certainly part of the people that believe that, then I think we have a responsibility to make this absolutely clear to people who might take advantage of it. A third view, of course, is that this is a place where top quality minds get together once a year. 
now in the modern or rather the recent idea of plenty of spare time the top minds don't just speak to each other they listen to each other they actually are i hope working towards some sort of integrated view of the big points that Andrew has discussed so i think that ANPA is a living social system which honors the vision of the amazing founders. Now, if people want to ask questions, this may be the point, but I'd like to come back to this because I have two other quick points to make. First of all, and there's a link which you can now use because Anton spoke, Way back in 1992, myself and John Fawn, who occasionally came to AMPA, and me, who had some money, which I'd extracted from my job in digital equipment, we managed to coerce Clive Kilmister, Ted Bastin, and David McGovern to get together and in four separate recordings, each is roughly 40 minutes, to discuss the combinatorial hierarchy and so on and so on and so on. That is the link. You'll get this. It's easy. But that's the first point I wanted to make. I have MP4s and there are four DVDs if you were uh, to go back to the ancient technology, but you can get them off the net. And finally, I would like to admit that one of the tasks which Pierre asked me to look at way back when I was interviewed in AD 1988, was to try and take an interest in financing. And he knew this because my job as a research manager was to spot research projects which were high quality and they always suffered, in my limited experience, from lack of finance. So you had the bright idea and the absence of finance and the job I had in digital was to, to solve that problem. And I've recently had a breakthrough and now I'm part of a formal company which is registered and makes intellectual property a tradable asset. I'm putting this up so you can ponder this. Anybody who's interested in that, I believe, finally, I've cracked the thing that uh, Pierre asked me to look at all those years ago. So. I'm done, Mark. Over to you. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, I, I, I suppose um, we've got Mike Manthe here, haven't we? Um, Mike, do you, do you want to add something, anything to what Mike's just said? Is Mike Anthe, Mike Manthe there and is um, he muted? Yeah, Mike is muted. Unmute him. All right, well, while, while, while we're waiting, um, has, has it, I suppose the question is, I mean, I, I've only been involved in AMPA for a very short time. But, but some of you have been involved in, uh, for a long time. I mean, David uh, McGovern, do you want to say some, something quickly about the American side of this? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I, I'll tell a little bit about the early days. Um, when uh, Pierre Noyes came back from, from a meeting with uh, Ted Baston and Clive Kilminster, Frederick Parker Rhodes and John Hampson, at Clive's Red Tiles Cottage in 1979, um, he asked me if I'd like to join this thing that he had just created. It's called AMPA. And uh, the, at that point, it was rather loose. And the only thing that really existed was, uh, other than the, the, the founders, was uh, a, a statement of purpose, which you, you saw uh, in some form a little bit earlier. <clears throat> The, uh, the picture that you saw of AMPA I took at the first Cambridge meeting. And as you see, we had quite a few people that, that showed up and uh, were from diverse fields. 
during our meeting in the, on the, the first few days, uh, I suggested that we were talking about funding and uh, how we would keep the thing going after that second year. And I suggested that one of the things we needed was a, a newsletter. Uh, John Amson uh, agreed with me and about two weeks later, Clive Kilmister said, so th the two of you will be producing a newsletter. And uh, Pierre seconded that, said you, you have uh, volunteered as, as uh, people volunteer in the army. Uh, so, so for a few years, we produced a newsletter and then it was eventually taken over by Farouk Abdallah. Um, those the very early days, uh, uh, new members came in from all over, uh, primarily by a lot of evangelizing by Pierre Noyes. Uh, he was traveling under, at Stanford University at Slack. He was traveling around the world at various conferences, and everywhere he went, he told them about AMPA and invited people to join. Uh, so, uh, one other uh, little point. Uh, Ted and Clive knew each other from the 40s. And uh, in fact, Clive was uh, helpful in getting uh, Ted's first PhD. And I believe it was 1952. And they worked together and produced a number of papers during that period uh, that they referred to loosely in the collection. I think it was about five papers as the concept of order. That, that actually was, was very much a basis for uh, the interpretation of the combinatorial hierarchy. Thank you. Has, has anybody else got any, any memories which they'd like to share of uh, what AMPA, well, particularly what, what AMPA means to them? Uh, I'd like to make a comment. There's another publication that's uh, really an AMPA publication, but this is pre-AMPA, this book, Quantum Theory and Beyond was edited by Ted Baston and was published at Cambridge University Press in 1971. Um, and uh, it contains probably one of the first papers on the combinatorial hierarchy that has appeared in a book by Ted Baston. And there are many people in this, there are certain people in this who are really in a certain sense integral to, uh, integral to AMPA, even though they may not have been in it uh, um, continuously, and those people are in this book, such as Roger Penrose, who wrote a, a, an ang a discrete approach to physics called spin networks, and, con and that continues, um, and um, Basil Hiley, and, um, and other people. So this is really still a, probably available in one way or another. It's a very excellent book, and will give some perspective on the origins of AMPA. Luke, can uh, the I other ask thing is, I have fond memories of uh, AMPA West. It was a very lively meeting uh, that occurred um, in complement to the in British meeting. Luke, can I can I ask you? Can I what... say something? Yeah, sure. Hey, Peter, uh, I I think the the thing that was uh, really great about it was that uh, you could give your talks and get, uh, and although they might be way off the normal scientific basis, you will always get uh, well criticized uh, and encouraged too, uh, uh, in relation to the work which you were doing. Uh, and also there was a very, very early book of uh, Frederick Parker Rhodes, The Theory of Indistinguishables, which amazingly, used what uh, at that very early stage of time was category theory. So Frederick was a very uh, uh, multifaceted brain who um, connected all sorts of different fields across, uh, across, across science. And uh, 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 it, well, it was uh, quite humbling to talk to him because he always knew he always knew something more in a particular field than, than you did.
Anybody yes, else? And, the, and that initial impetus uh, of the combinatorial hierarchy was very strong. And, and even though it was, it was a very difficult discussion to have because one was trying to uh, construct somehow physics out of, uh, out of the acts of discrimination and to see how they would be related to simple acts of discrimination. Uh, and, and, and it was built to a certain degree and then it, was, it became hard to, hard to extend it, and it still is. Uh, it, it was clear that to the founding people of Ampi, it was a powerful impetus to create a group, to have a discussion about that point. And this continues in its way right to the present day in the Ampi discussion. I, I was going to say, you know, it's the connection between these two social systems that Mike's been talking about. That, that seems to be a key point, really. How, how, I mean, Gordon Pass for me is is part of the connection because um, obviously that connects to you, Lou. Um, but um, but you know, where, how do you see do you see this sort of continuous stream? Well, the Pask is concerned with the social system aspect of it, with the cybernetic aspect of it with the reflexive aspect of it. Um, and similarly, the, that, that uh, desire to look at things from the point of view of distinction goes back and relates to Spencer Brown as well. Although I don't think Spencer Brown ever had any direct contact with the AMPA group as far as I know. Um, and, and it's still a question about how to handle the idea of discrimination in relation to founding physics, uh, it, it takes different forms, but it is related to cybernetics and it is related to reflexivity and it is related to many other thinkers. Hey Mark, I have a, a story about Gordon Pask. Uh, in my management research thing, I was able to give away money and I became canonized as an industrial professor at Harriet Watt University. And one day, my single responsibility was to interview Gordon Pask and summarize his speech. <coughs> so I met him without the students there, and um, he started talking about ANPA. Now, this was about 1983, and Frederick Parker Rhodes had been dead some time. And he told me he'd just been speaking to Frederick. So I, I just continued without any you know, hesitation and so on. And I am never to this day sure whether he really was or whether he was referring to Frederick's work. But he managed to talk anyway. No, he, he, he gave a magnificent talk, as Lou said, about cybernetics second order cybernetics and stuff like that and they you know the student body were fascinated but in my private conversation just to sort of figure out how he ticked right you know that was just chatting and he said i spoke to frederick last night story for nickel <laughs> great <laughs> mike manthe i would like to hear you and talk about program universe and stuff like that. Press the space bar, Mike. You're still muted, Mike, please. Mark, can you unmute Mike Minty? Minty? At least Mike got his video working. That's good. Mike, we still can't hear you. How about stumming from Granville then? Yeah, Granville. Shall Granville speak? 
I'm trying to. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Ah, can you hear we me? Can hear you. Ah, yeah, the computer. The, I'm ashamed to admit this computer is 16 years old. <laughs> um, so, well, the first first point was um, uh, 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 um, but uh, I'm very curious about the binary part of string physics um, went on to get involved with the combinatorial hierarchy, which is the, at its foundation, is the no, no, notion of discrimination. Of course, the, the basic is and then it's 15 years since I was involved at the start of Amber and met here, and I suddenly find that. Hello, 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 hello. You hear me now? Yes. I can hear you. I should be okay. I should. Uh, you should be able to hear me now. Okay. Yeah. Anybody hear me? Yeah. Yeah. We we got you, Mike. Uh, Grenville was just saying something about. Hello. Uh, Hello. I'm looking here. Okay. Okay. Grenville's breaking up. Yeah, Granville, Gran can we can we come back to you in a second? Because we can't really hear you because the, the internet connection isn't very good. Is that okay if we come back to you in a second, Granville? Mike, can we can we ask you now now that we've got you here um, and and with your mic working, um, can can you say something about your race? Yes. Yeah. Right. My what? We can hear you, Mike. Keep going. Uh, well, I don't know what you want me to talk about here. Uh, I worked with. Uh, Pierre on the, you know, I, I worked with Pierre on the combinatorial hierarchy, uh, and uh, we wrote a famous program together called Program Universe, where we tried to simulate uh, the workings of the combinatorial hierarchy. Uh, even though all along, Clive and Ted were very unhappy about this because uh, they felt we were putting in too much by hand. Uh, but really, what I felt this reflected was that neither Clive nor Ted and maybe even Pierre really understood computers. Their understanding of computers was heavily rooted in the, in the late 50s. I always felt that. I remember uh, Clive said once to me, this would have been in the, around 1990, that he had finally realized that the computer could have caught, talk back to you. He'd understood this idea of time sharing. This was 1990 or so. Uh, I was just floored. Uh, so they never really understood uh, computers in the more modern sense that we do now, I think it, uh, So uh, I was, uh, I, I left the combinatorial hierarchy and, and uh, for the members because it wasn't lining up with the more combinatorial kind of stuff I was doing with Clifford Algebra. And it turned out, I learned later that Clive was, had an old love affair with Clifford Algebra and he warned me off them as being very seductive. But of course, I ignored him. Uh, so I don't know. I'm just kind of rambling here. Um, nobody has mentioned the fact that John Amson just recently, a couple of years ago, showed that the Kalmatoria Hardy was actually formerly a bust, uh, that the, six, the 15 transformation matrices that you needed to get the thing off the ground actually uh, didn't exist. The last one didn't exist. Now, maybe I misinterpreted what John said, but uh, that was my understanding that in the end, the covenant of the hierarchy uh, had a fatal formal flaw. Um, perhaps somebody else can uh, straighten me out on that. Uh, as far as um, the uh, spiritual stuff that uh, Mike Warner was talking about, that was an interesting time uh, with the uh, 
philosophers, the Epiphany philosophers. Mark, yes. Uh, Peter Marshall speaking. If I remember right, yes, Peter. you did some very, very valuable work before AMPA at the University of New Mexico on, on parallel, parallel computation. Which I think was very, very relevant. To well, yes, that's been my uh, my study all along. Mike, can you say something about the the work that, that Peter's talking about? Then the, the parallel computational work. Well, Peter, I don't know. I lost your audio. Yes, yes, that was uh, always my interest was uh, concurrent uh, computation. And uh, I was uh, fortunate to discover the Clifford algebras uh, were exactly what I was looking for to describe such things. And uh, it turns out Clive, uh, as I said before, uh, had a long affair with them, so he was helpful. And uh, perhaps I should mention just now, there's, uh, he, it was Clive that uh, I, f I found them in, in a book, but I didn't know what they were. And it was Clive that said, uh, I went to him uh, at one of the AMPA dinners and said, uh, showed him this article uh, uh, by uh, Eddington. And I uh, said, uh, what is this? And he wrote on the back of my napkin, he wrote Clifford Algebra. And that's what I needed to know. I've been looking for at least 15 years for the right mathematical tool. Now I finally had it. I knew this. Uh, and so, uh, my work all along and since uh, up to now where I've gotten a patent on the stuff now uh, has been an elaboration of uh, this insight that I was able to gain using Clifford Algebra. Maybe I should just throw in here that I wouldn't be able to do anything that I've done without Doug Matsky. Uh, he's been my friend and colleague since uh, 1994 where I met him uh, and I'm pleased to have brought him into AMPA. Uh, he uh, did a PhD under me, uh, and he was the one that sort of translated uh, quantum mechanics into a Clifford algebra that I could understand. Uh, I had given up trying to understand uh, the mathematics of quantum mechanics. It was so highly polished, you couldn't find the bugs. Uh, so I was very pleased to have a different way to go about it. And when Doug, as a part of his thesis, wrote a calculator, uh, a symbolic calculator for Clifford algebra over Z3. And uh, that is what has allowed me to do all this work as I've been able to do. And so now uh, I have what I consider to be a, a complete theory of uh, consciousness and uh, physics at all. It turns out to be U1 cross SU2 cross SU3 cross SO4. Uh, it all came home. It's beautiful and it's just exactly what you would like for a theory of everything. I don't know if that's what you're after, Peter, but that's what I got. And I should mention that I applied for a patent on this and the patent was granted this last May of 2020. And so I'm now looking to uh, find a way to license uh, this uh, without destroying the world. I think I'll stop there. Doug, I think that's your cue. Hey, thanks for the, you know, I'll be talking about this in two weeks. Mike will be talking on Monday and I'll be talking about it on Tuesday, 20, 25th, I think. And, um, you know, Mike, Mike was able to uh, teach me about what it was that we needed to do to make Clifford algebra or geometric algebra work. And then we said, well, we can't do this manually. We have to have a tool to do this. So literally the newest version of this tool is 1500 lines of Python code and you can interact with it. So this notion of interacting with geometric algebra is really possible now. You can go into the interpreter, type expressions, and I'll be showing that at my talk. And, but the other important thing is for, for, for my PhD, which is out on my website, quantumdug.com, you can see my dissertation out there. If you really are bored and you have trouble sleeping, that's the great PhD to go read. You know, you can, it'll put you to sleep right away. And so with that said, um, but what we did show is, is that there's some unusual differences when you put quantum computing in geometric algebra versus Hilbert spaces. And I'll be talking about that in my talk in two weeks as well. So you'll, you'll, you'll get to see what we've been working on. But uh, Mike's insight and, uh, and my insight combined is uh, a great team and we've done some amazing stuff and we make predictions like the nature of entanglement is completely different in geometric algebra than is Hilbert spaces because quantum states that are entangled are in an irreversible 
state because the operators are irreversible. So that is an actual stable low energy state where with a ratio with a ratio of information. So you can't make those kind of predictions if you're in a Hilbert space. Can I ask Peter Rowlands, um, you know, to what it is, when you came into AMPA, where, where were these discussions? What, what state were these discussions about the combina combinatorial hierarchy and, and Clifford yeah. algebra and all of that you just stuff? get my video up. Yeah. Um, well, the combinatorial hierarchy, I first came in 1997, I think. Um, and the combinatorial hierarchy was very much the dominant theme of several of the speakers, but not all by any means. And I, I, I wasn't speaking about it. And I, I came in through another conference that we had in London that Pierre Noyes used to regularly go to. And he kept going off to Cambridge halfway through our conference. So I wanted to know what that was all about. And I found out it was this AMPA meeting. So that's why I first came to AMPA. And I previously met Clive a few times um, and had reviewed one of his books. He wrote a book on Eddington, which he'd reviewed. And so I wasn't totally unfamiliar with some of the people. And that was a lot of the, the things that were being discussed. Now, I was into geometric algebra in a different route through my work on the nilpotent theory and was already talking about aspects of that at some meeting. I remember Doug coming and uh, having some very good conversations with him. I remember having some very good ones with Mike at various times during those, those early days when, uh, when he came. Because I, I noticed that uh, Mike had a paper early on called Quarks and Quaternions. And I'd been using Quaternions connected with Quarks for some time, so we had a discussion about that. Um, so that was pretty fruitful and yeah, but I remember a lot of things about AMPA, been through many different phases of it. After both Ted and Clive died, people were concerned that we might not be able to keep it going, but uh, through various, the, the goodwill of various people, including Nicola and Grenville and, and later on um, Anton, you know, we were able to get going in Roland's castle. The reason, by the way, we went to Roland's Castle with somebody who hasn't been mentioned is um, uh, t Tony, Tony Deakin, who, who uh, has collaborated with, has done quite a lot of mathematical work and he's collaborated with Lou and, uh, and also with Clive. And Tony's still with us, I believe. I hope so anyway. But uh, he, he, he was... He had, he had various medical problems to start with and his wife had worse medical problems. So he said he couldn't come anymore. And when we, we were no longer meeting in Cambridge because we had difficulties with the venue and so on, we, we thought maybe we could meet in Roland's Castle. And it was a really weird place to meet because we, we found this fabulous church hall that's really good. And they were very helpful to us and very positive to us. And it turned out to be really nice. There was plenty of accommodation there. So it was a a good place to go and, I, and I'd like to go back there again sometime and I did actually look for the for the castle I don't know if anybody's ever found it but I, I think it was only ever a mutton bale I don't think it was ever a proper castle um, so um, so that was so things shifted somewhat from the combinatorial hierarchy after we lost to Clive and Ted and we moved it more into other areas and uh, or possibly ones that were more, you know, I was more inclined to work in. But Ted did once ask me to write something on the combinatorial hierarchy, and I did so. I did it for the, the AMPA meeting. Um, I wrote a, a short paper on that and on how I could, and he was, and Ted was interested in what I'd done. He used some of that in his work, so we had connections there. Uh, one great thing about having Ted was that he'd been a fellow of King's College Cambridge. So we went to dine there. We could actually walk on the lawns. Would you believe it? Ordinary mortals aren't allowed to do this, but fellows and their guests are. So we were able to do that for year after year. Um, so, but uh, no, we've had some very good times. And then we had a good meeting in Liverpool last year 
despite the difficulties. Um, and one of the good things was that it followed immediately after a meeting on, on laws of form, which, um, which several people here were also at. And uh, Andrew, who's here, was one of the organisers of that meeting. Um, and both were held at Liverpool University. And we were going to do the same this year, not laws of form, just ANPA. I believe there's a laws of form next year that might be held in Liverpool. So people will be welcome to come to both meetings if we go back to Liverpool. Maybe we'll go back to Cambridge, maybe we'll do Roland Castle, who knows. Anyway, there were, there were great times when we had some, a lot of really good uh, things were produced. And we had some really outstanding visitors. Uh, Nicola got John Conway to come and he gave a, um, a really, really good talk of which a version is into the, in, into the, um, into the, there is a version of the proceedings which was written up, though he didn't write it, uh, of what he said. And that's considered a major part of his work now. Um, but very sad to lose him in the in this COVID pandemic. Um, and we, we also had other other interesting visitors. Some, someone mentioned Basil Hiley. Well, Basil Hiley did come quite a few times early on. And uh, who else came? Well, we had a string theorist. We had Raphael Sorkin came. We had. Um, Julian Barber came, though I didn't meet him because I, I missed that part of the meeting that we, he was at. And quite a lot of other interesting uh, people who, who um, gave guest talks at the meeting. So all in all, great time. Carry on. Absolutely. Um, Nicola, you, you've been coming to this for ages. How, what, what's your story with Ampa? Um, well, uh, I, I think I, I think I came. I was invited by Clive. Uh, I think on a misunderstanding, really. Uh, he read something that I'd written about the integers. Um, it was when I was working for the doctorate, and um, I, I, yeah, Professor Rotansi got me to to actually to self-publish and I called it who carved up the integers they never died and so it was looking at the changing concept of number and the importance of the integers and so I think Clive thought I was a discretist which I'm not um, I think that the uh, I think that the integers are really, really important. And, and I, that was, I remember your early talks, Peter, because that was why I could relate much more to your work than I could to the combinatorial hierarchy, because you started, you, your, your, the first talk was on two, and the following year you did a talk on three. And then it was this, the recognition of the distinct quality of the integers. So, so, but yeah, so, yes, yeah, so Amber has changed and it's been, and we've missed you, Vanessa, definitely, because um, I met Vanessa through, through Amper. Um, read the combinatorial hierarchy and John Ampson, um, my understanding, it was what you were saying, Mike, about it kind of being finished. He, he has said recently that um, Keith Bowden, we haven't mentioned Keith or our letter, who were really, really important in the Cambridge days. Um, but Keith, apparently Keith has been in touch with John Ampson again, and they've now found that they made a mistake about the mistake or something, and they're working again. With, I don't know. But um, I, I've, yeah, so there's some, yeah, obviously, yeah, there's different work that I've related. I relate to, obviously, your work, Lou, and, and, uh, and to your work, Mike Manthe, and, and so it's, and then uh, Dina. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I, what can I say? It's just, yeah, so looking, uh, I, I mean, I suppose in, in a way, yeah, um, Yes, I know what I'll do. I'll take up your, I'll take up a couple of things that you said, Mike, which is one, you, you mentioned the fact that you mentioned 
spiritual matters as being grimy, which I really obviously take exception to because my sense is that that is actually where we, you know, where we are now. I mean, this is, this is 2020 and there are a lot of very interesting things going on. And I think that uh, how I, I just I think this I think this is such an interesting group. I will be talking more about this obviously on Friday. So, um, but but I, I will just say that to talk about the spirituality is is not to be not talking about material. You know, so that's uh, yeah and and. Interestingly, and Nina Sotina is not here, but she, she and her daughter Nadia came. I'm not sure how they came, but they came a couple of years ago, and they came. But they've come to Ampa and Pampa. Oh, we haven't mentioned Pampa, which has been really lovely. Um, which we started. John Amston and I started in Anstruther, so that so that John so that people could meet so that John could meet people and, and people could meet John because he can't travel anymore. And also, we wanted to set up something where there was more time for conversation, because the way that Amber had developed, it was there were just a lot of intense, very interesting presentations, and there were Q and A's. But uh, uh, and obviously, conversations always happen in between times. But we decided that for Pampa post Ampa gathering, we would have com presentations only in the morning and the rest of the day we could all gather and have fun and talk about it. So, so yeah, so those have been important and, and that's how Pat and, and some other, you know, other interesting people have come in as well. But hopefully we can continue that maybe in this form. Okay. Um, Vanessa, um, I, I mean, to be a biologist amongst all this stuff, I mean, and what's your story with all of this? Hi. Um, well, I was sort of, while I was being the molecular biologist, I always had this sideline ever since I was a child, looking at geometry regarding some of these, uh, some of these aspects. And um, I met Peter Rowlands at a, um, it was a meeting with Brian Josephson, um, and I listened to his lecture and although I couldn't understand it, I could see some of the symmetries within the work and I started, this, this is describing my geometry. So we followed on the conversation in the pub afterwards and found these analogies in our work, which was extremely exciting. Um, and then we started our collaboration, but yes, I agree. It's been, it's been tricky understanding some of the physics, but uh, <laughs> it's been a great, great adventure. Um, and yeah, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing some more on the geometric programming because that's an area I would like to move towards. So I have some ideas of my own regarding this. Be fascinated to see what's coming up uh, in this week's meeting. But yeah, no, it's, it's been, a great adventure, I must say, <laughs> as a biologist, walking into physics and geometry. Yes, it's been lovely, really lovely. Well, I have to say, I mean, we've been doing a similar thing because uh, Peter Rowlands and uh, John Torday, who's also here, who's a biolog biologist at UCLA, we've also been exploring the space between biology and physics. And it, it's been absolutely fantastic, really. Um, John, I, I don't know what, if you can say something quickly about your experience of this encounter between biology and physics. Um, <clears throat> unmute myself. Yeah, um, I was going to say it's interesting because I just recently published a paper, paper on the singularity of nature, and I had to think of some entree to rationalize that. And I thought to myself in the lead-in sentences that when I, up until the point that Einstein equip, um, made energy and mass equivalent. It was highly speculative, but then it, all bets were off. And I also wanted to make another inflammatory comment. I'm sure it will be. I'm gonna watch my laptop go up in flames, but um, it's my, in my way of rolling out the merging of evolution, evolutionary biology and quantum mechanics, 
um, and being a, a strong advocate of David Bohm, it seems to me, um, and I'll put this idea out, that it's only when um, life entered into the cosmos that there was an explicate order. Before that, it was all implicate. So, Nicola, when you were talking about <laughs> spirituality, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm of the opinion, and I will talk next Tuesday about this idea, that it's because we're material that we think everything's material, but that's really wrongheaded. The reality is that it's all energy. So you can trace evolution right from the, if you want to call it a, the Big Bang or whatever, or, or some from the inception of life uh, as we know it, um, you can trace that energy pathway all the way to right now. And so that's a very different way of thinking. And I do think it has some merit, even if may be uh, somewhat speculative, but I think that there are data that, could, can, that can and will support that idea. I, one of the things that um, has, has probably united our interest, um, you know, between uh, thinking about biology and thinking about physics is, and, and particularly in last year's ample, was, was thinking about nothing and um, the importance of nothing. And it's certainly something I've, I've been talking to Andrew about. It seems to be something that unites the thing that Lou mentioned at the beginning, this whole business of making a distinction. Um, Andrew, you don't. Can you say something about nothing? Uh, nothing is a, a readily available substance out of which to make a universe. Uh, if you go back, you know what is X made of, is made of Y is made of. Regularly available nonsense. Um, it's um, it's a it's a beautiful simplicity about nothing <clears throat> and. The idea of nil potent algebras and things that are the kind of interesting square roots of nothing are also very beautiful. So I would choose nothing for its beauty as well as its good sense. Thank you. Oh, could I just interject that just to say that with all due respect to Peter Rowlands, my biology and his math and his rewrite system are really highly analogous. So the idea, for example, that in Peter's math, he introduces, the, he, he talks about the concept of zero being important to conferring significance to the number one in, uh, as an attractor is no different from a cell being an attractor. So there are highly um, significant, I believe, homologies in the sense of origins between the mathematics and the biology. And I don't think it's coincidence. And in fact, Peter uses some of the verbiage in Peter's book on the foundations of physics are very similar, if not exactly the same as the verbiage that I use. And I don't think it's coincidence. Lou, can you say something about nothing too? Because um, it, it clearly seems to relate to Spencer Brown and it probably relates to that book that you held up at the beginning. There we go. Uh, I have a quote from Spencer Brown for you. Uh, in relation to his, his enlightenment experience, according to his own uh, description, which happened, as he said, long, sometime long after uh, laws of form. I realized that the only thing, that is a non-thing, that would be sensitive enough to be influenced by a stimulus so weak that it didn't exist was nothing itself. That is, nothing is the only thing that is so unstable that it can go off of its own accord. The only thing is sensitive enough to be changed by nothing. So if nothing could change nothing, we have inevitably the appearance of a first distinction. And the rest, including the ineluctable appearance of all this, inevitably follows. So, uh, I don't hear you. Uh, you presumably hear me. Um, yeah. So that that um, that uh, also corresponds to something that you can do with laws of form. Perhaps I should do it. Uh, can uh, can hear me? I'd like to comment on what can you just said. Can you hear me? Uh, I'm sorry. Did you hear what I read? Yes, it was beautiful. Okay, yeah. um, uh, and um, you can summarize that formally by showing how by introducing number zero, one, and so on, 
in laws to form that zero raised to the zeroth power is equal to the first distinction. Nothing raised to the nothing power is equal to the first distinction. Wow. Mike, you wanted to say something. I wanted to. I wanted to tell. Uh, I like that. Lou. That we'd actually heard him. That was yes, it. I just want to point with this talk of uh, Neil Putin's that uh, the model that I built is. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, that uh, the model that I built is purely combinatorial and echoes the combinatorial hierarchy. The uh, operators, which are uh, the operators which are uh, entanglement operators, they also are quaternions and they're all nilpotent. So the whole thing is made out of nilpotent uh, uh, entanglement operators. And uh, you get the story that gravity is basically a combination of the second law and uh, entanglement because you generate the space on the fly. Also, I just wanted to th say to, uh, to Nikki that I think she misunderstood what I said. I think that uh, the spiritual aspect is uh, part and parcel of what I am proposing. It's, it's all physics and it's all spiritual. It's all the same thing. It's all Mike, we lost you. You're muted, Mike. Oh, what did you, uh, let me, uh, I don't know uh, how far I got before you lost me. You were talking about it all being the Everybody same say thing. say what the last thing was they heard? Yeah, that you were talking about it all yeah. being the same thing. Can you tell me how far I got before you lost me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you know, I think was, that was it. I quit at the end. It's all... Yes, it's all made out of nilpotent operators, that's correct. And the nilpotent operators are also entanglement operators. Okay. So. Okay. Um, so I, I, I think we're, it's, it's now um, six o'clock in the UK. And I'll so. be talking about that uh, in a couple of weeks on Monday. Okay. Uh, Mike, I want to ask a question of your presentation, Mike Horner. Do you think listening to this that actually we do have these two social systems. They seem very, very closely connected to me. Uh, which two social systems do you mean? Well, the Amper, Amper the first Amper with um, Ted Bastin and um, um, Pierre Noy, and the second, the second Amper with Peter and Lou. Um, I, I think. Um, you know, coming at it from a sociological point of view, one social system has to have its, you know, what's the fancy word, autopoiesis, and you as an individual or your thoughts can be part of many social systems. So let's say that we've got social system east, social system west, then the whole thing is maybe a larger social system and deserves some distinction in some way to be explained by these people who worry about that stuff. Yeah, fair enough. Well, I mean, I'm, uh, what I'm very happy is that the, there's already some focus on content, and yet there's this sort of human side and people are agreeing that they get benefit from uh, being part of and for the social systems. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I hope you felt that it was a reasonable introduction. I didn't know whether to drone on for an hour or just drone on for 20 minutes, right? A droning on for 20 minutes is absolutely fine. OK. Um, I, can I, um, I'll, I'll ask anybody who hasn't uh, wanted to, what, uh, hasn't said anything yet if they want to say something. But can I just say something quickly about the rest of this week? So um, as things currently stand in the program, we're going to meet at 5 p.m. UK time every day this week. And uh, tomorrow, Peter's going to be talking. And on Wednesday, Lou. On Thursday, Dino, who we haven't heard from yet. I have to ask Dino what he thinks about all of this and his, his story with Ampa. And then on Friday, 
Nicholas going to do something kind of end of week, sort of Friday, let your hair down kind of stuff. I think that's, that's fair, is it? Well, uh, if I may interject, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Dino. Uh, uh, well, uh, I, uh, I'm a newcomer in uh, AMPA, uh, and uh, I, I feel uh, quite uh, a strange <laughs> uh, member because I come from the humanities. And um, uh, the, the reason why I, I got in touch with Ampa, and about this, uh, I, I would like to ask something about, uh, to, if he's still there, uh, to David McGovern about uh, Ampa West. But anyway, uh, the reason why I, I got an interest in Ampa was that uh, I was concerned with uh, uh, computational uh, 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 text analysis, uh, meaning uh, uh, content uh, analysis, uh, not just uh, parsing or doing uh, syntactical thing, but uh, to 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 analyze the the, the semantical content. And uh, uh, I happened to uh, uh, find on uh, uh, internet uh, uh, some something about Tampa West. And I uh, wrote to, to and that, that's why uh, what I, I, I'd like to uh, ask to David McGovern to tell uh, something more about him. About, uh, I got uh, uh, in touch uh, with Tom Etter, uh, who was a member of uh, AMPA uh, West. And uh, uh, we had uh, uh, an exchange of a few, uh, a few emails. And I got the impression that he, he, he uh, didn't say that uh, what I was saying was completely nonsense. So then afterwards, he, he put me in touch with uh, Keith Bowden at uh, Burbeck, uh, who uh, we had an exchange of, uh, uh, mail exchange with Keith. Uh, in a, mm, so he was sort of he was being inquisitive. Uh, who should be uh, <laughs> wanted to get in touch with that? And I remember at uh, one point uh, I was trying to 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 ask and say something was non commutativity, and uh, uh, that uh, probably influenced Keith. <laughs> and so he, he told me, "Why don't you come to Ampa, which was a stage at that time still." in uh, Cambridge at uh, the, uh, uh, w w w what was that, uh, um, not, not, not uh, the college, uh, the Anglican college, but uh, the, um, uh, the other uh, former, anyway, uh, 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 they, they are on the same street, but uh, uh, it, it was uh, the venue of, uh, of, of Ampa, and that's all. So uh, if, uh, uh, David uh, McGovern would like to tell me something more about Tom Etter. Tom, Tom, Tom Etter I heard that he died in the meanwhile. I would be glad uh, because he was the first contact uh, with uh, with Ampa for me. Do you know what year did you first come to Ampa? Oh, I, I, I can't remember exactly, but it was in the in. Uh, about uh, uh, 10 years ago, something like that, uh, more or less. Uh, I don't know uh, a few years uh, former uh, or a few years after. And then, uh, uh, well, uh, what I shall, uh, as I said, uh, I haven't got a, a former paper to present, but uh, uh, I have some uh, ideas uh, after reading uh, Parker Rhodes' inferential semantics, uh, which I think is very important uh, for what's going on now uh, uh, in uh, also in artificial intelligence uh, about, uh, and application of computational uh, methods to uh, text analysis, uh, text mining, and text big data, deep learning, these kind of things, uh, which uh, uh, came from the cybernetic uh, 
uh, the connectionist uh, approach of, of cybernetics, uh, which has changed dramatically in my mind uh, the uh, and uh, the approach of uh, contemporary artificial intelligence, which was at the beginning connectionism was out. Uh, um, people like uh, Minsky and uh, all those, these people at MIT, they didn't want to hear anything about connectionism and so, but uh, in, in 2008, there was this inversion uh, of, uh, and uh, now everybody say, uh, in data science talks about uh, the uh, connectionist uh, uh, adaptive systems and this kind of things. So no, that's just for uh, for uh, why and uh, the reason why I came to to Ampa uh, was that I wanted to understand something uh, from uh, competent people, uh, physicists and mathematicians about uh, what I think it is the uh, 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 an uncertainty relationship between uh, uh, semantics and uh, and syntax and not only in uh, uh, natural language but also in formal languages uh, uh, mike uh, Mathy was uh, talking before about clifford algebras and in clifford algebras uh, uh, i read the quotation by david astoner saying that uh, there are two different interpretations of the number a quantitative one and uh, a, a, a an, an operative an operational one so this is something which uh, means that there is no one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, 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 syntactical units and semantical units anyway i, I can say something more about this uh, on thursday if i if I managed to, <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I remember Tom Etter with the, because he, it was he who uh, was the first contact I had uh, with them. Mark, can I just say to to uh, Neil Buzetti that I'm highly uh, I highly advocate. I think we all know we're siloed <laughs> in our own disciplines. And I think that those silos have to break down if we're going to have a paradigm shift that is really effective. That's why I wanted to present at this AMPA meeting. In my opinion, everything is experimentation, whether it's science or the humanities, it's all one of a kind. And so I see the option, the opportunity to see a, a leveling effect in terms of the way we think about these things as more as a unity rather than as disparate disciplines. Yes. Uh, well, uh, uh, Dino, uh, yes. a person, a person from Ampa West, whom you would have really enjoyed meeting. He's no longer with us. Is Tom Etter, who was a, uh, an important pivot in Ampa West, and had many ideas that were in between language and physics and philosophy, and he was the inventor of a conversational computer program from the 1980s called Raptor, which you may know about. Uh, in any case, his writing is still available and could be in, uh, entered into this discussion that we're having with you, I think. Thank you, Lou. Yes, but uh, I remember him with, uh, um, because uh, as I said, it was the first contact I had with, uh, with them. I don't know how I, I got to him, but uh, that, uh, that was it. Tom Etta came to Amper East as well. Um, I, can, I can remember, I think the first meeting I went to Ampa, he was there, gave a paper in Cambridge. I see. But I don't know whether he came on any other occasions, but he came on that occasion. If, uh, if I may ask, answer your question, Dino, you know, about uh, Tom. Tom joined Ampa West in, uh, I think it was 85, um, and it was right after he had invented Raptor. Uh, in about 88, he took over a bunch of duties that I had been performing and, <clears throat> and turned our newsletter, excuse me, <clears throat> turned our newsletter into uh, the Ampel West Journal um, and then continued to publish that. And that's probably what you found on the internet because he started putting it up on the internet. Yeah. 
uh, fairly quickly, as soon as he could, uh, which was a few years later that uh, that became available. Um, and he, I think he put it up on a bulletin board before the internet was available. So uh, and just to, to clarify, yes, Tom did pass away uh, in 2013. Uh, and it's a, a great loss, I think. Uh, Tom was a, a great person. Uh, by the way, I've, I've, I will, I've put together a little uh, biography of Tom and I'll provide that somehow. Maybe we can post it some way or other. Uh, so that's available. Uh, Tom had a very interesting background, and uh, I found out that he was lifelong friends with Marvin Minsky, uh, which really surprised me because he never mentioned it in, in our many conversations. But he had a lot of connections, and uh, there's another fellow that uh, is very important in uh, algorithmic probability uh, by the name of Ray Solomonoff. Uh, he's now recognized as uh, the inventor a discoverer, if you will, of uh, what led to uh, Kolmogorov, uh, famous theorem. And uh, Ray and Tom Etter were also very close friends. I've been working with uh, Ray's widow over the last few months and uh, uh, discovered all these things that, that uh, Tom had been involved in and just quietly did and uh, never told anyone. So. Thank you. Wow. Thank you ever so much, everybody. Um, I mean, obviously, this is the beginning of this experiment in um, AMPA and uh, getting everyone together and getting everyone to talk. Um, tomorrow, Peter is going to, well, Peter, do you want to say what you're going to talk about? Yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk about ground unification. I mean, this is definitely a physics talk, but uh, I hope people will find, in, find it of interest because it's a big question, and if we can solve that big question, that's a, you know, a big advance. So that's what I'm going to talk about tomorrow. Great, and everything's going to be recorded. I've recorded everything here, so if there was anything anybody said and you can't remember what you said, what they said, you can watch the recording. I've, I've got to make the note of the book. But Lou, can you hold up that book again, actually? I'll, I'll just... Uh... <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Okay, right, I've got it. <laughs> Um, th this is great. I think this is going to work. I mean, I, you know, we'll see. Uh, the timing, perhaps, particularly for our American friends, is perhaps not ideal in the middle of the day. Um, so I think, you know, let's play it by ear um, and just see. Let's see how this week goes. I'll send out a uh, a kind of message um, on the Amper chat to see what you think about how it's gone today and whether you think that this, you know, this is a viable thing and we can keep going. Um, but I'm, I'm excited. I think this is going to be really good. Thank you, Mark, for organising it all. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. You've done brilliantly. Well done. And thank you, Mike. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you particularly for Mike for um, a great presentation. And it really, I think it's got us going. And um, uh, you know, we're starting to have the discussions that I think are, are going to continue um, over the next few weeks. So, so this is this is really good. Um, you won't hear discussions, as you know, you you won't hear discussions like this in any of your universities. Um, it's not happening in universities at the moment. This is a problem. So it's happening here, and, and let's let's make the most of it. Great, thank you. Okay, folks. So until tomorrow, yeah. we'll meet again. Bye. And I look forward to Peter's presentation. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. bye.